Good morning. One more time. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning at Cedar Rock. We're so grateful that you can gather with us today as we praise King Jesus together. As we begin with our scripture and prayer of invocation, uh, Todd and Louise Thornton are going to come up and lead us in that time. And uh, we are so grateful that you can gather here on this beautiful day to worship the Lord Jesus together. Y'all lead us in the scripture and prayer of invocation. Good morning. morning. Our first praise hymn this morning is Worthy of Worship, page three, and we will sing all three verses. Please stand if you're able.
Father God, you are worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise, worthy of all that we can give you. God, we thank you that we have the privilege and honor of worshiping you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Again, welcome to worship this morning. A couple of announcements, a couple of praises, and then some things to pray for. First, uh, some announcements. Next Sunday is first Sunday. And so, you Cedar Rock regulars, what does that mean? Breakfast, First Sunday Fellowship, 9.15 a.m. If you can uh, bring uh, uh, something to share down in the church basement fellowship hall, we'll have a potluck breakfast, First Sunday Fellowship. Hope you can join us for that time. Also, it's uh, getting near that time of the year where it's time for graduations and all that. So, uh, if you have someone for a graduate recognition, who would like to be recognized as a graduate and uh, from preschool on up, uh, please let me know here in the next week or two, and we'll make sure that we have them included if we do a graduate recognition. Um, some things to praise the Lord for. Number one, uh, we want to praise the Lord yesterday for the um, uh, ladies' tea, and so uh, I was not there, uh, not invited, but um, it seemed like from uh, all accounts of folks that I heard, it went really, really well, so uh, we want to praise the Lord for that. Let me, let me thank a couple of people. Uh, first, we want to uh, thank uh, Miss Louise for teaching, so we'll thank her for that. <laughs> want to thank Miss Millie for organizing the whole shebang, so we can give her some thanks. And then I was given specific requests uh, to acknowledge all the ladies who helped in any capacity, ladies and men, because there were some, uh, some guys who helped move stuff and help. Uh, Jean and Joe uh, were mentioned. Miss Patsy was mentioned. You're not, Miss Patsy's not here. But anyway, she also helped a lot. And then some of the youth helpers on uh, Wednesday night last week helped move tables. So if you helped in any capacity, would you stand up real quick so we can thank you as well? Don't, don't, don't. Come on, come on, come on. Here we go. Don't be bashful. For some of you folks. There we go. Yeah. Millie, I tried. Some of them just don't want to stand. That's all right. Well, thank you for that. And now, uh, 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 it was a great time of fellowship, a time of, uh, of reaching out to uh, our community. We talk a lot about that we as a church want to grow, right? Not numbers. We don't care about that. The Lord's going to do that. We care about growing. Um, remind me, which way? Deeper? Wider? Together? Here we go. Together, then? Higher. Very good. Yesterday was some time of growing together and some time of growing wider and reaching people. And every Sunday morning, we have a time of growing deeper in Sunday school. And I just want to celebrate uh, the fact that um, uh, if Pauline's numbers are correct, and I am trusting to be so, that we had over 100 people uh, in Sunday school this morning committing to growing deeper. So will we celebrate that this morning? <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. This is and what we want to celebrate. Not, church is not just a, a spectator sport, right? It's not just a time to come and hear uh, a message or sing some songs. Church is a body of believers. We get together and we do these things. And so praise the Lord that, that the majority of you all are, are here on Sunday mornings, committed to growing deeper as well. And we want to invite you. If you don't have a, a Sunday school class, uh, talk to me. I'd love to put you in touch with our teachers and find a good place for you. So praise the Lord for that. Some things we want to pray for this morning. We want to continue to pray for Miss Dana and uh, the Gupton family. And uh, during this time, the service is next Sunday at 3 p.m. at Lewisburg College. So uh, hope you all can join us for that time of remembering and celebrating Willis. And uh, we just want to continue to pray for you, Miss Dana, and y'all's family, and uh, shower you with love and concern and care. So uh, let's continue to pray for, for them. Um, we want to pray for Miss Irene Collins, uh, who had back surgery this week. And, and God bless her. You know, she's, she's strong. Uh, <laughs> went to go see her, and, and she's you know, got a little pain and stuff, but she keeps saying, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. So, um, so praise the Lord for that. Let's keep praying for Miss Irene. I know she appreciates your, your visits and your calls and cards and everything else. Let's keep praying for Miss Irene. Uh, Spencer Dean has a surgery on May 7th. We want to lift him up in prayer. Um, we want to pray for um, Ricky Brantley. This is Hope Moore's father. As he's had some health issues and, and, uh, and now is home from the hospital. Let's lift him up in prayer. Uh, Pauline's sister, Nancy Schuyler, uh, let's pronounce that right, had uh, multiple biopsies this week, and so we want to lift her up and her family up in prayer as well. Hoping for results tomorrow, so let's pray. 
Hoping for, hoping for good results. We'll pray for that tomorrow. Uh, Rodney Sharon, many of y'all know him. He's visited uh, a good bit recently, uh, had a health episode this week. Let's lift him up in prayer. And then we want to continue to pray for our missionary families, the Walujos, the Leonards, the Wests, and, uh, and pray for all of us that we would um, live on mission as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I'm going to pray aloud. You pray in your own seats as we seek his face. Father God, we praise you, Father, for who you are. As we entered this space to worship this morning and saw the beautiful sunshine, the blue skies, we thank you, Father, that you are the creator of all of this. Father, we also praise you for the work that you're doing in our lives and in our church family. God, I thank you for folks who are committed to growing deeper in their faith, bringing their families and committing their families to grow deeper in their faith. I thank you for our teachers who, who invest so much time in preparing to teach and study, whether they're teaching adults or teaching children or loving on babies, God. Thank you for this time we have to grow deeper in our faith. We thank you for this time we have to grow higher as well. And God, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ the hope that it offers us, knowing that each and every one of us is a sinner and that even this week, each and every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. We thank you for the cross of Jesus and the forgiveness that you offer. We pray for these needs and requests, the very public needs and requests, and the very private. You know about them all, you care about them all, and you are at work in our lives, even in the midst of the suffering and the hardship, to bring glory to your name and to conform us into the image of your Son. God, we trust you and we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we sing our next praise hymns, I just want to... Personally, thank you from my family for everyone's act of kindness towards our family and the love and encouragement that's given us strength to get through this time. I don't think we could have done it without you, your prayers, and and all the love that we received from you. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, And just keep Danielle in your prayers as well. She went to the emergency room last night, not feeling well. A little dehydrated, blood pressure's up, and she's been having a lot of back pain and stuff. So they think she has like a bacterial infection, kidneys, and trying to give her medicine for that. So that's the reason why she's not here this morning. But please keep her in your prayers because she's just been under a lot of stress, and I worry about her. So thank you to everyone. I love you all. Our next praise hymn is Be Thou My Vision, page 60. And we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please stand if you're able. Be thou my vision.
referencing um, page 411. And with this, we will sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of this one.
Amen. Thank you, choir. And thank you all for being here today for worship as we collectively turn our eyes upon Jesus. If you have a copy of God's Word, if you would hold it up so we can see it. Here we go. If you don't, we've got the Burgundy Pew Bibles, and we will be in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 3, as we continue our study to Paul's letter there to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. As you're flipping there, just an update. We uh, had our um, spring Tar River Baptist Association meeting this week, and um, some, of, some of you all were there at that, and the uh, restructuring process continues, and uh, it was a good meeting. And at some point in the future, I will share kind of what the vision for that is. Our hope is to share that with uh, every church in Tar River. Uh, to see what the Lord is calling us to cooperate together for and about. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. When you're there, say, I'm there. And if you are able, if you would stand in honor of God's word. Ephesians 5, beginning with verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Father, this is your word. Help us to submit to it, to live by it, to let it shape us and transform us for our good and your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. It's possible you grew up believing that the Bible is merely a bunch of children's stories. The kind of stories about animals on boats and people in whales' mouths and folks with uh, happy lions, people being healed, the stuff that makes up children's stories. Or maybe you think of the Bible as just merely a bunch of wise sayings or ancient to-do lists. But as we study the Bible... The Bible is so much more than that. And that becomes abundantly apparent when we do what we do here on Sundays, as we walk through books of the Bible. And when we walk through books of the Bible, we let God set the agenda each step of the way. 
And so sometimes what we study as we walk through books of the Bible is light and encouraging. Other times it is heavy and weighty. Today is one of the heavy and weighty times. But God has providentially placed each of these scriptures here in his word for a reason because the Bible is not naive to the human condition. God is not naive to the ugliness of what we human beings are capable of when left to our own devices. And in fact, God's word speaks directly into those ugly, dark patches of our lives. This morning, as we study this heavy, weighty text, you will be tempted to tune out. You will be tempted to think of literally everybody else but yourself. But the challenge for us this morning is will we, will you, listen to God's Word? Will we, will you, submit to what it has to say? Let's recap how we got here in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 4, we begin to see in Ephesians how Paul transitioned from speaking about the gospel, what Jesus has done, to speaking about how that affects how we must live. In the section just prior to this, he's been talking about putting off sin, being renewed in our minds, and putting on Christ-likeness. He's been giving a variety of examples to help us to see what that looks like in our everyday lives. In the passage just prior to this, he talks about how we are called in general to be imitators of God as beloved children, to walk as Jesus loved us, to walk in love. And as he transitions from that to deal with a very specific issue, he camps out here for an extended period of time. He's been addressing a lot of sins, but he addresses a particularly grievous spectrum of sins in the passage that we just read. The peril of sexual sin and the promise of light and fruit. Let's talk about the peril, then we'll see the promise. First, the peril of sexual sin. Look again at verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Paul begins this section by addressing sinful conduct. And he highlights three things. Sexual immorality, a phrase that encompasses all forms of sexual sin. It's intentionally broad to... to Uh, describe things from adultery to premarital relationships to prostitution, etc. Sexual immorality. He mentions the word impurity, which refers even more broadly to actions and attitudes that make one impure in the sight of God. And then he moves even more broadly to the topic of covetousness. In the first glance, covetousness seems to have very little to do with sexual sin. But isn't sexual sin at its core basically covetousness? Wanting someone or something or some experience that isn't yours and ought not to be yours. These three things, Paul says, must not be even named among you. So he addresses sinful conduct and then he talks about the the peril of sinful conversation. Look at verse 4. He says, let there be no filthiness nor foolish talking nor crude joking which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. He lists three kinds of conduct. Now he lists three kinds of speech, filthiness and foolish talk and crude joking. You don't need much imagination to imagine what that sounds like. It sounds like four-letter words. It sounds like joking about things that ought not to be joked about. It sounds like so-called locker room talk. Paul says, these things are all out of place. They don't belong in the people of God. Thanksgiving is what should be on our lips instead. So sinful conduct and sinful conversation ought not to be found in the people of God. Not one iota. Why? Paul minces no words. Look at verse 5. For you may be sure of this, 
that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul says some pretty shocking things here. He says the sexually immoral, the impure, the covetous have no inheritance in the kingdom. He says that these things cause the wrath of God to come on the sons of disobedience. Our initial temptation when we read this is to seek to explain these words away, but maybe we ought to sit with them for a second. To feel the gravity of sexual sin. And maybe even particularly today, we need to sit with these words for a moment because we live in a culture which does not treat sexual sin with gravity. Sexual sin pervades so much of pop culture. We become almost immune to hearing about elected leaders with scandals. We just assume all of them have them. Increasingly, we don't see sexual sin as an affront to God. We shrug, just a little thing. We say boys will be boys, girls will be girls. Or we, worse, twist Scripture to condone sin. Think about people who might say, you know, he who who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus didn't say that to say that sin's okay. But sexual sin is a big deal. Because it flies in the face of God's good design for sexuality. The God designed sexuality and intimacy as a good gift for one man and one woman within the context and the bounds of this gift of marriage as an act of selfless love. And in this way, it is a gift that leads to joy and flourishing. But we in our sinful natures, we are tempted to deviate from God's plan. Whether that be intimacy before marriage, or intimacy outside of marriage, or intimacy with the same gender, or any other deviations from God's plan. And when we deviate from God's plan, we treat sexuality selfishly. We view it as something that is merely meant for our own pleasure and enjoyment, or we wrap our identity in it, or we view it as perverse entertainment, or worse, worse, we use this good gift as a weapon to prey upon others. But this is how our sin nature works. Our sin nature wants us to take God's good gift and deviate from God's plan. Like Adam and Eve, we are tempted to take that forbidden fruit, to trespass the good boundaries that God has established. But when we do this, it never turns out well. When we deviate from God's plan for sexuality, we never get the happiness that we're after. Sin always harms us. Sin always harms those closest to us. Sin always harms the church, and sin harms the world. And sin leaves us lonely and broken and empty. The Ephesians lived in a culture swimming in this sexual depravity. They were constantly tempted to reject God's good plan for sexuality. And truth be told, our culture and our world is exactly the same. But God calls his people to live differently. One of the commentators, Paul Hainer, says that Paul is asserting that these sins should be so universally absent from the body of believers that there should be no occasion to associate them with the church. If God's people are called to live differently, do we? Do you? Do your lips regularly spout crude jokes or perverse language? 
Do you watch pornography? Are you sleeping with someone who is not your spouse? Are you pursuing an intimate relationship outside the bounds of God's gift for marriage? Heaven forbid. You're using sexuality as a weapon against someone else. You are engaged in these sins and they don't bother you. Alarm bells should be ringing in your heart this morning. Let me read again what Paul says. For you may be sure of this, verse 5, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Sexual sin is an ever-deepening spiral, and when left to its devices, it always leads to destruction. Um, I had a friend who we're going to call Josh. Not his name, doesn't matter. Josh was a co-worker with me at the seminary. Josh was always bright and upbeat and encouraging. He was the kind of guy you always wanted to be around. He would say something positive. And his job was very similar to the job that I had. Eventually, he left that job and he went to go pastor a church not too far from here. Got married. Everything in his life from the outside seemed to be going great. But things on the inside were not great. Came out later that evidently Josh made inappropriate criminal actions towards a minor was confronted and took his own life. Josh didn't get to this place overnight. It was years and decades of feeding sin. I have this friend, Josh. You have people you know. We all can think of the laundry list of church leaders, Baptist leaders who have fallen into sexual sin. Paul's point here is that kind of sin, this kind of sin, sexual sin, ought not to be even named among the church. Why? Because this is where it leads. The peril of sexual sin. What hope is there? Well, Paul pivots here from the peril to the promise, the promise of light and fruit. Look at verse 7. Paul says, therefore, do not become partners with them. He says, this is how the world lives. Not how you're supposed to live. Don't live like that. Don't do that. What do we do instead? Verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul here, he knows the people in this church at Ephesus. He'd been there. He he knows them well. And he knows that they used to be the darkness. They had been guilty of some of these very same sins. But he reminds them of their identity. He says, guys, God has declared you to be light. Because this is what the gospel does, right? Right? The gospel tells us all the bad news. Each and every single one of us is a sinner. Each and every single one of us are the ones who have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Apart from the grace of Christ, we are all sons of disobedience. We all deserve God's wrath. But the gospel, in addition to pointing out our problem, points us to the solution, namely that Jesus lived, Jesus died in our place, And Jesus rose again so that when we acknowledge all the filth in our life, repent of it and believe in Jesus instead, we can be saved. And though we were darkness, 
Paul says we are light. Paul says if God has declared you to be light, live like light. Walk as children of light. And the fruit of that kind of lifestyle of walking as a child of light is not sexual immorality. It's not impurity. It's not covetousness. It isn't the filthiness, the foolish talk, or the crude joking. Walking as a child of light is all that is, he says, good, right, true. It's living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And it involves taking that light that God has declared us to be and shining that light on others. Look at verse 11. Paul says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul says the church's role is not to partake in unfruitful works of darkness. The church's role is to expose those things. And Paul here, I don't think, is talking about exposing the sins of the world. That's what we're most eager to do. We really enjoy talking about the sins of the people outside the four walls of this building. We really enjoy complaining about the sins of the world out there. The truth of the matter is, it should not be surprising for us to see the world act like the world. It should not be surprising to us to see sinners sin. It's in their nature. Sinners are going to sin. No, Paul is not talking about exposing the things out there. He's talking about exposing the sins in the church. Of bringing your own sin into the light. Of bringing the sins of brothers and sisters into the light. And we bring sin into the light, not in a gossipy, tabloid-style way, right? The goal is not to humiliate people or air dirty laundry or turn it into entertainment, not at all. And we bring sin into the light in a loving, redemptive way because we believe God's Word says the best way to deal with sin is not to keep it hidden, to bring it out and let it be dealt with. I think about it like this. Um, back in seminary, we lived in a two-bedroom duplex, actually the same uh, neighborhood where Zach and Abigail will be living uh, once they get married here in about a month. That's right, why they're getting married in a month. So that's pretty awesome. We need to pray for how many days? 19 days. Not that Zach's counting. Not that he's counting. He's counting. Anyway, I uh, hope this doesn't scare you off from the duplexes, Zach. But we, we loved our duplex. Great place, great neighbors. But I noticed pretty early on that there was some sort of moisture problem in this place. Um, in fact, I, I got my dad's dehumidifier and I put it in there, and that thing was constantly running. There was something wrong with water somewhere. I told all the facility guys, no one believed me. One person said this was a lifestyle thing, that it was just moist in my house. I said, what are you talking about? Anyway, when we moved out finally, uh, they found out that no, it actually was a moisture problem. There was a hole in the roof. And so there we go. All that to say, um, I was right. And secondly, I was right. Not a lifestyle thing. When there's that much moisture in a space, uh, it's not good for stuff. And if, let, me, let me give one example. I had a um, little Tupperware container with my shoes. And I don't know about you, but there's certain shoes I wear all the time and certain shoes that I don't wear all the time. You know, the special occasion shoes or the shoes that I wore five years ago and I keep them around just in case I wear them again and I probably won't ever wear them again. Well, in my Tupperware container of shoes, there was uh, shoes at the very bottom, and they stayed at the bottom because I never wore them. One day, I was cleaning out stuff and going through there, and um, I found the shoes at the bottom. There were some old um, Converse shoes from way back, kind of a cream-colored Converse, and they had started to grow mold. 
See, uh, they were down there in this dark, dank corner of this bucket. And with all the moisture in the air, there was no light down there. There was no air circulation down there. It was just darkness in the cold, dark, dank part of my shoe bucket. And the mold grew. The perfect environment for it to grow. Sexual sin is like that. All sin is like that. It thrives in the dark, dank corners of our heart. Where there is no light. Where there is no air circulation. And in that darkness, sin can fester and sin can grow and turn into this nasty, ugly thing. And if you want to deal with it, you gotta, can't leave it down there. you got to get it out of your closet, expose it to the light. What does all this mean for us? What does all this mean for you? Let me be very crystal clear from God's Word this morning. If you are harboring a secret sin of any kind, especially a sexual sin, Satan right now is tempting you to say, you can keep that hidden away and it'll be fine. If we believe God's Word, the best thing to do to deal with the problem Bring it to the light. Bring it to the light. Have a brother or sister who can walk with you to help you navigate this. And if you don't know who to talk to, talk to me and I can point you in the right direction to people who can help you walk and deal with the sin. Because sin withers in the light, but it thrives in the darkness. So first, if you have a secret sin, bring it out. Secondly, if you know someone dealing with the sin, you as, your, as their friend or their family member or whoever, you owe it to them to not let them sweep it under the rug and ignore it. The best thing you can do for that person is to lovingly address it, help them bring it to the light. You are not harming them, you are helping them in the long run. Dragging sin to the light is not easy. Dealing with sin, our sin, my sin, your sin, it's difficult, painful. And dragging sin into the light doesn't remove consequences. Sin always hurt others too. There are natural consequences for the things that we do. I think back to my friend Josh. I think back to what would have happened if instead of doing what he did, he repented of that sin and, 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 and worked towards dealing with it. He still would have lost his job and he still would have gone to jail and those would have been good things. The same is true with our consequences of sin. Even when we repent, there may still be consequences on a smaller scale. But if we believe God's word, God can use the light of Christ. God can use brothers and sisters to help heal and purify and change us so he can develop that fruit of light in our lives. Yes, there is peril to sexual sin, but there is a promise of light and fruit and flourishing to those who repent and walk in the ways of Christ. This morning, maybe as you hear all this, maybe you feel pretty hopeless because you've got a sin in your life because a loved one has a sin in their life, or you're feeling guilt for things you've done in your past, and you're wondering, is there any hope for me or for this situation? And if that's you this morning and you feel particularly hopeless, let me, let me encourage you with this. First Corinthians, Paul taught a very similar message. If you know the church at Corinth, they were messed up, to put it gently. They were dealing with drastic sins of all sort in their midst. Listen to what Paul said to them. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds kind of like what we just read with a longer list of sins, right? This is what he says. And such were some of you. You hear that? Not are, were. And such were some of you, but you were washed, 
You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. The same God who could save and sanctify these Corinthians is the same God who could save and sanctify these Ephesians who is the same God who can save and sanctify you. We talked to a couple of different groups in the room this morning. Number one, unbelievers, if you do not know Jesus, you can't fight this on your own. Your only hope is Jesus Christ. Run to Jesus this morning in repentance and belief and receive the gift of life from the gospel. Second, let me talk to believers. If you claim to know Jesus, but you're mired in sexual sin, your only hope is Jesus too. Run to him. Bring your sin to the light because Paul says doing so is evidence of belief in your life. Third, if a friend or a family member or a loved one is mired in some sort of sin this morning and you feel hopeless because of that, your only hope is Jesus too. Cling to Jesus as you navigate this. Let him be your true north. Finally, if you feel like you're doing pretty good, Satan would love nothing more than to tear you down, ruin your family, bring further shame on the church of Jesus Christ. Your only hope is Jesus too. Cling to Jesus and be prepared to fight the temptation with truth. Because Jesus is not blind to the ugliness of our lives. He's not naive to what we are capable of. He is fully aware of the darkest parts of our lives and of our world, and that's precisely why he came to save, to redeem, to heal, to restore, to bring light to darkness, to produce fruit on barrenness, to bring, take our present failures and get us to the point where we can say, and such were some of you. To say, as the hymn at the end of our passage says, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that you would awake those of us asleep, raise us from the dead, let the light of Christ shine on us, that we would see the perils of our sin, but the hope that comes from dealing with it, from receiving the gift and light that comes from Jesus and walking in the paths that he has for us. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand and sing hymn 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. We want to sing this as a prayer to the Lord and pray that he would do that in our hearts and lives right now. 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
do verse 4 a cappella together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with my spirit till all shall sing. Christ only always living in me. Father God, have your way in us as individuals and as a church. God, we love you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. We want to have the Moore crew come on up. And my sign man come on down. Y'all have gotten to know this family uh, over uh, of the, the past seven, eight months. And, and we've been praying for Dustin. And, uh, and so it's good to see him and continuing to get healthy day by day. Praise the Lord for that. We have Dustin and Hope Moore and Maylee and uh, Brantley and Presley. Hey, Presley. <laughs> and uh, this family has become such an integral part to our church. And, and they, um, Dustin and Hope and Maylee, want to uh, transfer a letter from Faith Baptist in Youngsville. And Brantley wants to follow, uh, join in by statement of faith and follow in believer's baptism as well. So uh, praise the Lord. So do we have a motion to accept them as members? First, second, all in favor, say amen. Amen. And now you finally get your own Cedar Rock sign. Would y'all give them a Cedar Rock welcome? I invite you to, to come down um, and greet them. And uh, don't forget, we'll take a picture as well outside, so don't run away. Um, watching you, Justin. Don't run away. Just kidding. And uh, let's conclude with, um, with a benediction this morning. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Go with God. This week.